granted, this machine you built, I mean, tell us mm -hmm. about what this machine does, what it is, and how you decided to build it, you know? The machine can make storms in the lab, ocean storms in the lab. So we can take a piece of the ocean that is about 100 feet long and 12 feet wide, um, sorry, six feet wide, actually, eight feet wide. <laughs> <laughs> it's 2.4 meters by 2.4 meters, and I'm doing the conversion on the fly. And we can make waves in it, and we can blow the wind over it. So we can recreate the interactions of the ocean and the atmosphere that you would get in a storm, but in the laboratory. How did you arrive at the, because it's quite large, it's 100 feet long, but why is this the right length to, to you know, because water doesn't have scale in the way that we think of scale. So how do we arrive at 100 feet as being the optimum length? That was as much as we could fit into the building. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it fills up a fair chunk of a large building, and we couldn't build a new building for it. So we had to build it to the scale of the building. It turns out that the kind of waves and winds that we can achieve are good to reproduce global average ocean conditions. And in fact, we can go a bit higher than that. We can, we can start to approach storm regimes. And the machine is scheduled for an upgrade this summer where we will increase the wind speeds to hurricane force conditions. Now, it's seawater, so I imagine it's built right next to the ocean, yeah? That's correct. It's housed here at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and we have seawater supply lines around the campus. And so we can fill the machine up with fresh water or seawater or a mixture, either one. But can I tell you why we built it? Yes, please. It's all yes, right. we're All waiting right. for. So why did we do that? Well, the ocean covers 71% of the planet. So what we live on, the land, is not as common as the water. You know, we don't tend to think of it that way because we live on the land. But just look at a, at, look at a globe and you, you see the vastness of the oceans. Not only do the oceans cover a lot of the globe, but for example, the top tens of feet of the ocean contain as much heat energy as the entire atmosphere. And the ocean is thousands of feet deep. So it's not hard to imagine, given these facts, that the ocean plays a, a, a central role in determining weather and climate. I mean, for example, here in San Diego, we have a fairly dry, sunny weather Usually, the last month has been a bit of an exception. Low humidity, perfect temperatures. But we're at the same latitude as Florida. But we don't get Florida's weather. And the reason for that is Florida has the Gulf Stream running up their coast. They have this warm, salty water running from south to north. And that has a profound influence on the climate and weather of, of Florida. Here, we in San Diego, we have an Arctic current that flows from the north to the south, and it's cool. And it, it, it keeps us cool and it keeps the humidity lower. So where the atmosphere meets the ocean is a very special and important place on the planet. It's this boundary that helps determine weather and climate. It's vast and a lot of exchanges occur across that boundary. About a third of all the anthropogenic carbon dioxide passes through that boundary from the atmosphere into the ocean and it's sequestered in the ocean. And of course, this is very helpful for us because it helps keep that atmosphere, that gas out of the out of the atmosphere. Many people don't know this, but when the wind blows and waves break on the ocean, you get white caps. You've probably both been out to sea on a brisk day and you get these beautiful little white caps popping off all over the ocean. That's an explosion of spray and bubbles when a wave overturns. So the wind blows the waves, the waves steepen, the crest of the wave runs faster than the bottom of the wave and it overturns and you get bubbles trapped in the water and they rise up and make foam and you also get droplets. Now that foam, as it bursts, 
creates a cloud of tiny droplets, too small for the naked eye to see. Those droplets contain whatever was in the water. They contain water, salt, and biology and chemistry. And that's transferred into the atmosphere. And those little droplets help form clouds and ice in the atmosphere. Well, clouds are tremendously important for both weather and climate. And clouds can either heat or cool the planet. And so we're, we're trying to understand cloud formation, and it's very difficult. And part of the, the answer to how and where are clouds formed and what role are they going to play in weather and climate comes from what comes out of the ocean. So we realized that what we need to do is to build a machine where we can control the water temperature, we can control the atmospheric temperature, we can make winds and waves, we can grow the biology. SOARS is made from non-toxic materials and it supports marine organisms. And we have growth lights, we have power LEDs and we have these big cylinders that come down through the roof to bring natural lighting into the channel. And that means we can reproduce the chemistry and the biology, as well as the oceanography, to understand this critical boundary on the planet. We can reproduce that boundary from polar to tropical conditions. We can make sea ice in it. We can cool the water and blow freezing air over the water and make sea ice. Then we can warm the water all the way up to tropical conditions. We can simulate the past, present, and future oceans by changing the gas in the machine. And we can inject carbon dioxide into the machine and we can simulate what is the ocean going to do 20 years from now or 50 years from now if we keep on pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. How will that alter the pH of the ocean? How will that alter the organisms? How will that alter what comes out into the atmosphere and change the ice forming and cloud forming properties of that material. It was a grand adventure to, to, to build it. Yep. Now, what effect does pollution have? Do you do you do you put plastics through the machine to to model that that what you know the pollution that's in the ocean to affect what's what our predictive models are? We have not done that yet, but we can, and we probably will. There will already be some plastic in the machine because it's in water off La Jolla Shores Beach. Yeah. And that contains a whole variety of things, sunscreen, microplastics, you know, and so all of that is already in the machine. But we could artificially introduce increased concentrations of plastics and see what that does. We've actually only done one major campaign so far. We we commissioned the machine about uh, four or five months ago. And we've had one major campaign so far, but we're right at the very, very beginning of what we hope to achieve with it. How long does it take to turn around a whole situation with the model? You know, you know, like when you say you've done one campaign, how long does yep. it take to turn around one campaign? A campaign could be as short as a day. If you go in there and there's something you want to understand about the winds and the waves, or perhaps you put a robot in there or a machine, an energy extraction machine, and you're testing it with the winds and the waves, that that might take a day or a day or two. I, I have run day-long campaigns with students, and we'll bring students in for a day and we'll run an experiment. And it could run as long as two or three months, depending on the scientists and their objectives and what they hope to achieve. So a couple of things, just practically, you when you do you ever just drain it and start over? I mean, are you because you're going from fresh water, you said, right, to seawater? Is that what you were saying earlier? So when you you're letting the water go, where's that water going? And then how do you get it back in? So you're having you're starting with a very pure, you know, space, or do you have to think about that? Like if that makes sense. Yes, to all of all of the above. Um, when we load the water in, it's either fresh water from the municipal supply or it's salt water from the Scripps seawater supply. When we discharge the water, it's discharged into the sewer, into the sewer system. It doesn't go into the storm drains. It goes into the San Diego sewer system. We have a permit to do that, and we're regulated on how quickly 
we can discharge the water. So we follow the local regulations that, that we need to follow to discharge that amount of water. It's a lot of water, it's 36,000 gallons. So yeah. we can only discharge it at a fairly low flow rate so that we don't overload that system. In terms of the organisms and the freshness of the water, when we pull the water in, it has already been filtered once because of the filters that exist on the local seawater supply. But we have our own filters and we can apply those filters or not. So we can remove biology or not, depending on what the, that investigator needs. If we need to, we can also sterilize the water and kill all the life in the water with UV sterilizers if we need to do that. Typically with the seawater, if we care about the biology, we probably won't run the seawater for longer than about two weeks because the organisms go through this whole evolutionary cycle over that time. And after two weeks, the biology that you have in there is no longer representative of what we have in the ocean. So in that case, we would flush that water and introduce fresh seawater after approximately two weeks. If the investigator doesn't care about the biology, we'll simply sterilize it. And we have recirculating pumps and filters in the machine. And in that case, we can just keep that salt water going for months. So, you know, the biology of the ocean is complex, right? There's the this transformation that happens in the evening, you know, between the day and the evening, but it's not necessarily to model that, or, or is it, is it, it, it does the, does the model that you're creating have to be accurate to actual conditions, or are we learning about the individual pieces, like now we're going to study wind, and we're going to study bubbles, or are we studying the biology in the tank, like how, what are we, what are we using this tool for? That's a very deep question and a very good question. And SOARS has been set up to do both, to study individual things in isolation and to study the full coupled system. So SOARS has four modes. We have a polar mode, a wind wave mode, an aerosol mode, and a biological mode. And in aerosol mode, that's really where we need the full system because the chemistry and properties of these little particles is influenced by the biology and the wind and the waves and the temperature. So all of those things need to be representative of what we find in the ocean. But for example, when we built the machine, the biologists told us, okay, this is what we would need. We need, we need natural lighting. We need it to be built from totally non-toxic materials. So there's no iron in the channel. There's no copper in, in, in the channel, no metals like that. We did tests on the layers that we use on the walls of the channel to make sure that they were biocompatible. And if that whole system is not clean enough for the biologists, we can line the entire machine with a huge internal bladder and there are attachment points within the channel that you can use to attach this bladder. And that would give them a pristinely clean surface boundary for the channel. And then they can introduce their own microbes and their own bio biological systems to study them with winds and waves and all the rest of it. Now, are, is your background as an engineer? Is it is, is your background as a a biologist? Like, what's your background that, that got you interested in this particular problem? Well, okay, I, my, my PhD is actually in math. And um, I call myself a mathematical physicist. So my love is physics. Mm -hmm. um, my training is in mathematical physics. And my, my degree is in math. And when I came to Scripps, I came to study the ocean. And I came to study sound in the ocean. And I've done a lot of studies of sound in the ocean. And that's a whole other story. That's about the mounting icebergs in the Arctic, for example, and studying breaking waves, making using the sounds of bubbles, not what you called me here today for. Uh, but those studies brought me to work with an atmospheric chemist by the name of Professor Kimberly Prather. And Kim is a very famous atmospheric chemist who works on these aerosol properties. I work on the waves and the bubbles. I'm, I'm sort of a bit known for my bubble work as well. 
So we started working together with some, some colleagues, with Dale Stokes, and Kim has a whole team. And we sat down and started working on how do we make the sea spray properly that is representative of what we find in the open ocean? But how do we do that in the lab and do it properly so that we can really study the system well? And we, we did that for about a decade. And over the course of that time, it just became really clear that we needed this big machine that could reproduce all of these different, different elements. And so, although my formal training is not in these areas, I go out and I study them and I work with colleagues who are experts, who are actually experts. So your background is as a, as in physics where we have universal principles and, and you're trying to bring that rigor into the, I mean, I guess it's not the biosciences, it's the science of what, you, when you're studying the sound waves, you have universal principles that as a backdrop, but you're trying to find those, those same principles in the oceans and the way that they move? Yes, the oceans, the way they move, what passes across the SE boundary, what comes out, what goes in. And although it's affected by the biology, and although the biology, as you've already pointed out, is highly variable and tremendously complex, it does exhibit reproducible patterns of behavior. So it's a, it is a system that we can attempt to understand, and I believe it's worth the effort. It's complex and it's not easy, but these are the problems we have to tackle if we're going to understand the future of weather and climate. We have to grasp that complexity and work with it. So what kinds of projects are brought to you, you know, and what are people specifically looking at and how does that tie to the problems of climate? You know, very specifically, what, what would be examples of different projects that get brought to you? For soils, for example, the formation of sea ice. How does sea ice form? And how does it interact with winds and waves? So there are some projects looking to use SOARS to do uh, studies of sea ice. There's the aerosol program, run through Kim's program, that I've already discussed about sea spray coming out and influencing weather and climate. I personally am very interested and concerned with the numbers and sizes of bubbles that end up in the water because that determines the droplets that get formed and it determines the dissolution of gases from the atmosphere into the water. In the history of science, we have exactly three open ocean observations of bubbles and breaking waves. It's really hard to do. You go out to sea in a storm on a ship, and you might have 30-foot waves, and you're trying to figure out what's going on in the top foot or so. Your instruments break. It's raining because you're in a storm. And it's extremely expensive. You might be paying $40,000, $50,000 a day for the ship. In SOARS, we can reproduce those breaking waves and the bubbles for you know, about a 20th of that price, and we can do it all in the lab. Now, are you finding that, it, because you say you've done one full campaign, so maybe it's early days, but are you finding that the small test is actually showing you models that are a uh, reflection of of what is happening in the ocean. Are we are we seeing that this is a a causality and not you know you know are we seeing signal from noise? Are we are we getting insights that we couldn't have gotten any other way? We're seeing very clear signals, so the signals are clear. We have to be very careful in how we interpret them because this is the first machine of its type on the planet. And we have to look at our data two, three, four times. We have to check what the machine is doing to the to the, the aerosol that comes out, for example, or to the breaking waves. We have to be very careful. So we're redoing some of our experiments to make sure that we are really on the right track. But are we seeing new things? Yes, we are seeing new things. For example, we're seeing a direct effect of the wind on the production of the sea spray. We're seeing a sudden threshold shift. The wind gets to a certain speed, and the amount of sea spray suddenly multiplies dramatically. Now, if that is a true effect that's also occurring on the open ocean, that will be new and profoundly important for the models that 
predict weather and climate, the global climate models, the models that operate on total global scales. They need to know about these kinds of effects. Now, if we were at CERN looking for the Higgs bogues, we would have to validate all of science before we did that, right? We'd have to figure out whether everything in the standard model actually was true it, within the machine. Otherwise, the machine wouldn't be making a, a, you know, wouldn't be true what we found. Do we have to do a similar thing, a, a standardization of when we start up the machine to understand what these things that we are that we're studying? Yes, we do. And over the course of us using it for the last approximately six months, we've learned a lot about the way it works and we've learned a lot about the way to run it so that we don't get artifacts. For example, when you run the machine with winds and waves, these little particles are being ejected into the, into the atmosphere and that atmosphere recirculates so the particles build up. That's good that we want, we want that sea spray to build up that way, but it also sticks to the walls. So when we turn the machine off and turn it on again, some of those particles come off the walls into the machine. So what we have to do is right, hose it down with water and we blast it with wind to clean off and rip off all those particles before we start making our measurements of the sea spray. And that, that's one example of how we have to be super careful about how we, how we run it. Another example, and something that we're still working on, is we've got large fans that push the air through, make it circulate. What do those fans do to the droplets? Mm -hmm. And we have to be very careful of that. And we're still studying that and making sure that we're not artificially creating droplets by running the, the air through the, through the fans. So we're not, we're not done with our forensics, if you like, our due diligence. We're, we're still working on that. And uh, we're hoping by in the next two or three months that we will get a, a, a number of runs, more runs done, and then we will know for sure. So when you run the experiment, does that data go out to lots of different people to interpret what it means? Or is it just the people in the lab studying it? Like, is And what's the vision for, for how it is going to be going forward? Well, it depends a bit on who's paying for it. Any work done funded by the National Science Foundation must be stored on a proper repository. And what happens is that the data is sequestered for a time to give the scientists who requested the funding to take the data time to work it and publish. And so the first way the data becomes available is through conference proceedings, conference presentations, public lectures, and publications. But after that initial period of time, then it becomes publicly available on data repositories. And I think that this data belongs to the public. The public is paying for it, it belongs to them. I think it's fine to give us the scientists an interval to work with it, but after that, it has to be made available to everybody. Now, are you finding universal principles from math in what you're seeing in terms of the way the wave decays and the, in the way the, the the interaction of some of the things are you seeing things that are are able to be uh predicted you know that is also a very penetrating question let me put it this way that you just imagine yourself walking along the shoreline of of the beach and there's biology you can smell it you can literally smell it you can smell the ocean because the waves are producing these particles and as you breathe in you're breathing in water salt and the plankton and the chemistry of it so you can you get that that wonderful smell of the ocean imagine a wave breaking so there's a wave crashing on the shore every wave is unique there probably haven't been two waves exactly the same since the history of the since waves have been breaking on the planet, right? And then you throw in the biology and the chemistry, and suddenly you're like, well, how do you search for reproducibility and structure in such a complex system? So what we do is exactly, well, what I do, my my particular craft, what I seek are the application of these unifying principles to these complex 
processes that are reproducible. There, and there are things about these waves that are reproducible. Back in 2002, uh, Dale Stokes and I published a paper in Nature on the fluid dynamical principles that control the sizes of the bubbles in the waves. So despite the fact that every wave is unique, it turns out that there are organizing principles that we can seek. And sort of the art form of this kind of science is to try and pose the right questions where you find the reproducibility of things that matter. It only matters if it matters, right? So if you found something reproducible out of out a wave and it doesn't make any difference to anything, well, good for you, but it's not going to help the ongoing task to be able to model and understand climate as, and, and, and whether as we move forward. Now, how one does that gets deep into the mysteries of the way the brain works. And all I can tell you is my own process looks something like this. I think about the questions, I look at the data, and I immerse myself in the process as much as possible. 20 years ago, I was putting my swimsuit on or wetsuit and going out into the breaking waves, taking photographs, sort of in them, looking at them, looking at them from the pier and just thinking about it. And I've found when you engage in that kind of process for a while, the brain starts to produce interesting thoughts. Like, oh, I wonder if this is an organizing principle, or I wonder if this system couples with that system in the following ways. Once you've done that, then you can start running experiments and testing hypotheses. I often think scientists like to describe science as though it's inevitable. You write down the first equation, and then you write down the second equation, and then five or 10 pages later, you have an answer. And I don't think science, science doesn't work that way for me at all. It's a mysterious and deep process of creativity that I don't truly understand, but I know how to engage in it. And so, and, and this is my life's work. And I think SOARS is a wonderful tool for, for, for not just me, but other like-minded scientists to engage in these problems. And it's part of the reason we built SOARS is so that biologists and chemists and oceanographers, we would all get together around this common boundary and start to talk and work this problem together so that we can synthesize a new understanding. That kind of just blew my mind, this, this notion that no two waves break the same or are the same in the history of time. I mean, what does that even mean? Did you know that, Jesse? Did you know that? I mean, or did you ever think about it? Because it it is such a, it, 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 I mean, what is that also telling us about, you know, knowing what, what our world is really about? Because you feel like when you're at the ocean, I live near the ocean, I grew up at the ocean, you feel like there is a kind of a consistency and a uniformity, if you will. What does that tell us about our, you, you know, about our world? Well, it is an interesting thing to think about, isn't it? And I think it works something like this. The standard model that Jesse's already mentioned, the standard model can predict with fantastic accuracy certain physical things, you know, to the magnetic moment of a spinning electron. I mean, it's extraordinarily successful. It, it, it's a real tour de force. And then, you know, the idea of somebody thinking with the standard model in their mind they come up with a notion like the Higgs boson that 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 predicts the the concept of 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 mass, and then you build a big machine and you go find it. That's that's that really blows my mind. But when you take the standard model and apply it to oh I don't know a thousand particles, it, it, the, the, the calculations become impossible. And there are quantum chemists who can now simulate, they can, they can solve the wave equation for that complex system over, you know, hundreds of picoseconds or maybe even nanoseconds and, and look at the way the, the, the atoms bind together into molecules and look at the way those molecules move around and interact using supercomputers. And those are, are a few million atoms or, or maybe even tens of millions of atoms. That's not a breaking wave, you know. 
what are they? They're, they're, they're a 6.023 by 10 to the 23 atoms in, in what, six grams of carbon. I'm probably wrong about that number, but it's something like that. So when you think about the number of molecules that there are in a breaking wave and, and, and how they would all need to be organized the same way for two waves to be the same, it, it, you know, it's just fantastically improbable that that would, ever, that would ever happen. So a lot of science boils down to finding these reproducible phenomena for systems that no two are exactly the same. It's still beautiful. You know, it's beautiful. You know, something can be beautiful. And, and you know, the essence of science is not that we understand everything. You know, that's, that's what makes it different than faith, you know, is that, that we don't have the answers. Um, you know, in a way, what you're talking about is it really feels like it's, you know, we're going back to almost Socrates, where, you know, all of these sciences hadn't been split apart into chemist and biology and, and physics, you know, it was still early, and we're just looking at images on the, the cave wall, but it's like, you have to return to that simplicity in order to, again, expand with this complexity from what we might learn from this machine, you know. Are you an environmentalist at, at heart? You must be, you've devoted your life to this. I am, yes, yes. I have a range of beliefs. I, I believe that if we keep on burning fossil fuels, that we're going to make life increasingly difficult for ourselves. But I don't think we should stop doing that tomorrow. I think the amount of human suffering and misery that that would create is incalculable. I think we need to move forward over time with a sensible progression between science and commerce and regulation. I think those three areas need to work together as an effective team to find a path forward where human happiness and safety is maximized while the impact of our existence to the environment is minimized. So that, that's my feeling in, in a very broad stroke on, on that topic. And do you... Do you feel like we're we're closer to finding clean, uh, safe power, you know, cheap power that that can be distributed to people? You know, it always seems like we take one step forward and one step back in terms of our understanding and, and, and the next great leap forward for mankind, you know, humankind would be, you know, clean, cheap power, you know? Yes. Actually, for my doctorate, I worked on fusion, nuclear fusion, as a source of, of clean energy. Ultimately, it may be a very important source of energy. I do think nuclear energy is very important, and I think that we should be looking at that much more closely. I know that there's a lot of public dismay over the, 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 the dangers of using nuclear fuel, but we're starting to see the dangers of using fossil fuels. Do you see things like um, National Ignition Facility, you know, uh, fusion being uh, viable, you know, as, as a, you know, as, as a way forward? Not in the next quarter century. And personally, that's just my point of view. But I believe that the scientists engaged in that endeavor are doing a fantastic job. It's an incredibly difficult enterprise. They have a hard task and they are doing a great job with it. But even once you've produced a reactor that's break even, and break even was achieved very recently, which was is a milestone. That's not the same thing as as producing a commercially viable fusion reactor. Moreover, fusion reactors have their own problems with radioactivity. The primary energy get output of a, of a fusion reactor that runs on deuterium. Uh, fast neutrons, and those neut the energy of those neutrons has to be captured and turned into, you know, electricity if you're going to use it to power power generators. Yeah. And the capture of that radioactive material creates a radioactive material. So we are still going to have to deal with radioactive waste. Now, the half-life of it will be greatly improved, and I think it will be a lot easier to deal with. But it's not completely free of some of the issues that, that we uh, find with fission. And the, the thing about fission reactors is, yes, they, they are dangerous if they break down, and that's absolutely true. And you have to deal with radioactive fuel, and you have to deal with radioactive waste product. But it's a solid. It sits there. It doesn't move. When you take 
the, the what's produced by burning fossil fuels, it's a gas and we just pour it out into the atmosphere. Yeah. Now, if we sequestered that gas and did something with it, great. But, we, but we're not, that's not what we're doing right now on the whole. You know, um, Sylvia Earle, you know, we, we've done some projects with her. Do you, do you feel like the stories, are there bright spots in, in environmentalism with regards to the oceans? Or, you know, we have these new marine parks where we seem to see recovery of species in them. I mean, do you see, how, how, do, you, how do you feel about where we are today in the oceans? Mm. Um, I worry about the coastal oceans. I'm less concerned about the great oceans, the, the, the deep blue oceans. I know that there's been a lot of concern about microplastics. And it, you know, I'm just giving my own personal view of, of the matter. And I those people who study microplastics, that's great. And 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 they should. But I'm not concerned about microplastics in, in the ocean. I am concerned about coastal pollution, coastal pollution. And, yeah. you know, and, and, and that's that's old news. You know, I've been diving in the reefs off Florida and uh, about a decade or two ago, and those reefs are essentially done. You know, you, you go diving off of the reefs of Florida and then go diving off the reefs in, in, say, Fiji, and you have these live, vibrant reefs in Fiji and, and not so much in um of, of florida and i i think that we need to do more to protect the coastal ecosystems we also don't understand well the connection between human health and the oceans i mean when the wind is blowing offshore and the surface breaking what comes out of the ocean blows in mm -hmm. and there are for example cholera is a marine pathogen it's it's not a great concern to us but it is a great concern on a on a on a global cultural scale Mm -hmm. and understanding the transmission of that pathogen from the ocean inshore into the open markets and into people's lives is an ongoing task and something that we need to get a handle on, I think. I, does you know, that answer your question, Jesse? It does. You know, when you see, you know, the Great Barrier Reefs were sort of thought to be over and then they've had some sense of recovery. Does it give you hope that maybe the 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 reefs off of Florida might recover? Yes, I think they will. I think as long as the water doesn't get too warm, as long as they stay within their biologically viable range of conditions, if we stop flooding the coastal zones with the fertilizers that we're putting on the land that run into the rivers and then outflow into the oceans, and we stop some of the uh, commercial activities that go on in, in the coastal waters, yes, I believe that some of these precious resources will recover. What's your feeling on noise in the oceans, all the boats and what that does to marine life? Well, that's another really interesting question, Jesse. I think that that is, well, I, I sort of have two responses here. One is from a cultural perspective. It's a very sensitive issue with the public. Right. And it can be dangerous if people put very, very loud sounds in the water. You can either significantly alter the behavior of or endanger the lives of marine mammals. And that that's true. But that that is the operation of very specific pieces of hardware, you know, ocean exploration. When you're looking for minerals, you make loud sounds for example, and you use the sound that penetrates into the seafloor, you watch what comes back and you can figure out what's there, which sort of gets me to my second point. A lot of ocean exploration, you know, we consume fossil fuels, a lot of that comes out of the seabed. Moreover, most of international trade is carried out over container ships. If we shut oh. that down, it would be a global catastrophe. So, you know, we have to be very careful about making loud sounds. But ambient, the ambient sound in the ocean is increasing because global shipping is increasing. Now, I think that the marine mammals, they're smart and they would do what we would do. They avoid it, you know. Right. And as long as we're not in their breeding grounds or their feeding grounds, they can probably cope with it 
reasonably well. You know, it's just a nuisance. I mean, maybe bellows around the engines so they don't make quite so much noise, you know? Or you just think about where the shipping lanes are, you know? Maybe you take a detour around a biologically sensitive area at certain times so that you don't disrupt mating behavior or you don't disrupt foraging behavior, for example. There may be compromises that, that could be made. To And there was a CNN, actually very recently, there was a CNN, a documentary on a fellow who spent his life doing that. And um, to my great embarrassment, I can't remember the name of it, but I, I was featured on it because of the work I do with sound in the Arctic. But there were some right. really, really great biologists working with sound, either in the water, which is what he did. And he's he spent his career trying to help fishermen and people who operate boats avoid hurting right. the animals. It's, it's, a, it's a great enterprise. It's yeah. uh, very well done. Have you spent much time up in the Arctic? I've, this will be my sixth, I think my sixth campaign. I've been going up since 2013. How beautiful is it when you're up there? It's an interesting experience. You know, it's like, for those of us who live in the city, there's an energy to the city. You go out into the streets and, and there's bustle and hustle and there's sound and there, there's activity and everything's going on all at once. And you sort of become used to the energy of the city. So you go up to where Svalbard, which is where I where I do my work on Kjons and Fjord, mm -hmm. and it's all gone. And everywhere you look, there are these Faustian landscapes, these, these mountains with moody, moody clouds and mist over them, and, and the glaciers and the ice, and a little bit of wild marine life. And you, you walk along the shoreline, and you, you walk over the moraine, so that the glaciers dig the stones out of the mountains and grind them and polish them, and then dump them on the shore. And, yeah. and it's, it's this amazing variety of just walking along where I walk, you can see greenstone, you can, you can see quartz, you can see marble. It's just all just thrown there on the beach. And I find when I go up there, it takes a week or two, but all that energy from the city just drains away. And then I can really be in this very special space. It's quiet. It's very spiritual in a way. You'll see Arctic foxes. You'll, you'll see terns. You'll see ducks occasionally. I go up there in the summer. How long is the day when you're up it's there? 24 hours. 24 hours of daylight the entire time? You have to be really careful. Or you just keep on working through. You've got to stop and go to bed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well... Thank you. You know, it's been a fantastic conversation. We really appreciate it, you know. Well, thank you for the opportunity to be a guest on your podcast. Yeah. And um, I, I appreciate your interest and the opportunity to talk about some of these things. Yeah. And I have one other question. Do you know Sir David King from the UK, climate scientist? I do, do not. You know who he is? Oh, he's proposing an experiment to refreeze the Arctic and to create artificial cloud cover. So to see if, you know, for three months of the year, there won't be sun to kind of slow down. I mean, we're not going to mitigate everything, but just kind of slow down the freezing of the mm. Arctic. It's a very interesting story. Well, so I'll, I'll fantastic that idea. He wants to have yeah. a fleet of ships spray. What does he want to do? He wants to have them spray water into the air. Yeah, up into the air. And it's all, there'll be like a 600 vessels that would be out. Yeah. At a certain point, right? And there'll be there won't be people on there. They're kind of you know robotically you know manipulated, and they're also working with the with the wind as well. And when the wind comes up, it's kind of, so when you're talking about that ocean spray, right? It goes yeah. up. Then they're going to create this literal cloud, yeah. an artificial cloud. I mean, you'll understand obviously way more than I. You know, we do the kind of this the science and the dynamics, but. It's an amazing uh, experiment that they're looking to put together with the, co you know, the cooperation of many countries and, you know, a lot of money to do something like that. But again, oh. it's sort of in the attempt to slow the freezing of the Arctic. It's a fantastic piece of geoengineering. The, the, the issue or something we all need to be very cautious of is the law of unintended consequences. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, yes. Um, well, they 
Yes, we agree. And they talk about that as well. I'm sure they do. I'm sure they're very smart people who have thought about this. But that's the thing about the law of unintended consequences. No matter how much you think about it, there are unintended consequences. You don't know what they are. <laughs> well, we, we've spent a lot of time thinking about on, on everything. But anyway, it was a pleasure to, to speak with you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Really nice to talk to you. You're very welcome. It was it was lovely to meet you both.